In 1982, 40-year-old George Emile Banks embarked on a ruthless rampage that would shock America to the core. Something in him just snapped. When he pulled the gun up and aimed it at me, I knew he was going to pull the trigger. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. Right about in here is where the two victims were laying, right on the street. And with it, the question, why had the ex-prison guard from Pennsylvania brutally murdered his own flesh and blood? There was a lady holding a baby. He shot her and the baby. And committed a brutal killing spree that would ultimately claim 13 lives in a matter of hours. But of the rifle was coming through the window. And George starts screaming at us, he's going to kill everybody. Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. During the 1950s and 60s, this once prosperous city in the northeast of the United States suffered a collapse of a booming coal mining industry, making life tough going for its residents. The city's economy partially recovered during the 1970s, but this decade of growth also experienced a huge setback in the form of a colossal tropical storm. Wilkes-Barre endured almost $1 billion worth of damage. But one of the worst moments in the city's turbulent history would undoubtedly be remembered for the actions of just one man during one unforgettable night. On an early September morning in 1982, the residents of Wilkes-Barre woke to the horrifying news that one of America's worst ever mass murders had just been committed on their very doorstep, and the man responsible had still not been caught. It was horrific, it's something that you would only see in a movie. Hundreds of police officers, along with countless journalists and onlookers, had surrounded a nondescript two-story house on Monroe Street. Detective Jim Zardecki was one of the first on the scene. All of a sudden, we heard the smashing of the glass, and I looked up there at that window and the butt of the rifle was coming through the window. Inside, one man was engaged in a standoff. I heard a policeman yell, we have him in our sights. And I'm thinking, are they going to kill him? The man sheltered behind the second floor window was George Emile Banks, who, in a matter of hours, had embarked on a killing spree that had left 13 people dead. Seven of the victims were children. But what had driven this 40-year-old Wilkes-Barre resident to embark on such a violent killing spree? And why had he ended up barricaded into an empty building on Monroe Street just hours later? 2.30 a.m., the 25th of September, 1982. Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Just 10 hours before the siege on Monroe Street. Several miles away, a 22-year-old, James Olson, had been attending a house party. It was a pre-Halloween party. All of our friends got together, and some were dressed up somewhere. We were in the house partying. They were, everybody was having drinks, having fun. It was, it was actually a good party. I went outside to get another bottle of booze out of my trunk of my car. And this is when we heard the noises. The, Boy, somebody's throwing firecrackers. We couldn't figure out what it was. So then we just see this gentleman walk out of the house with the camel. He had a camel hat on. My buddy Ray Hall says to him, hey, I know you, and pointed to him. And he turned the gun. He had the gun at the side like this, picked the gun up and shot him. I thought they were pulling a gag on me. It wasn't a gag. It was far from it. Especially when he turned a gun to me and said, you're not going to live long enough to tell nobody about this. All I can remember is the eyes. He just had that look about him, like, this is it. I knew he was going to pull the trigger. That's something that's in my head will be there probably for the rest of my life. 
Across the other side of town, Jim Zardecki was at home when his night's sleep was cut short. I got a call from our chief deputy coroner telling me that there was a homicide in Wilkesboro. Whilst Zardecki raced across the city, local police were arriving on the scene at Schoolhouse Lane. There they found James Olson and Ray Hall critically wounded. And when I got shot, the bullet, when it went through, it just like pulled the life out of me. It's like Jesus Christ himself reached down and like, like pulled my insides out. Like it was just a, a really empty feeling. Leaving two men for dead, the gunman was immediately on the move. He walked down the street backwards, holding the rifle like this. Walked down the street, and from what my friends tell me, of course, because I was already shot at the time, he had put the gun to someone's head at the end of the street and stole their car. Local tow truck driver Bobby Kadlubowski was working the area when he came across the unfolding events. The night of the shooting, uh, this was the scene where it was lined with police, ambulances, and, and all type of uh, rescue units and stuff. And right in this general area right here, probably right about, right about in here is where the two victims were laying, right on the street. Police frantically tried to save Ray Hall's life. The officer actually had, uh, had a rag trying to stop the blood flow. And I, I just knew in my heart that this guy wasn't going to make it. Ray Hall died at the scene, whilst James Olson was rushed to hospital with serious gunshot wounds. Police began to piece together the chain of events. Witnesses reported that the man suspected of the shooting had exited a building just meters away. The same building from which James and Ray had heard strange noises emanating only moments earlier. What police discovered inside turned an apparent shooting of two into a fully fledged killing spree. When we came in and we walked into the house, I was able to see the bodies just strewn all over the living room at that point in time. I looked around, I saw bodies covered up, blood on the walls. I just turned around and went back out. I didn't want to see any more. The house belonged to 40-year-old ex-prison guard George Emile Banks. Inside, eight members of his family lay dead, and Banks was nowhere to be found. In the early hours of the 25th of September, 1982, Wilkes-Barre police reported to a house party where two people had been shot, one fatally. As they investigated further, the apparent shooting of two turned out to be far worse. In a house just meters away, they discovered the bodies of three women and five children. The hunt was on to catch a spree killer, and ex-prison guard George Emil Banks was identified as the prime suspect. George Banks was born to mixed race parents on the 22nd of June, 1942. His mother was white, his father was black, and uh, in his early days, um, growing up in Wilkesburg, Pennsylvania, where you had a African-American population of far less than 1%, and coming from a biracial family for George Banks, that was extremely difficult. During the early 1940s, parts of America were still struggling with segregation. At that time period when George was growing up, there were still some racial tensions, you know, between African Americans and whites. So it wasn't the, exactly the best time period to grow up in, but, uh, you know, his, his family tried to make the best of it. Banks's parents never married and the family's racial mix seemed to torment him throughout his life. Psychiatrists would say, of course, that the experiences George went through could lead to him hating himself and disliking his own black identity. The fact that he was mixed race made him feel he wasn't accepted by either black people or white people in the community. George continued to struggle with this perceived racial prejudice throughout his late teens, prompting him to enlist into the military as a means of escaping his troubled youth. In 
So after high school, uh, George enrolled in the military, but the problem was George wasn't the type of person who liked to take orders. He always liked to be in, in control of his own life. He liked to be in control of uh, others around him, so he couldn't take orders well from superiors, and that ultimately resulted in uh, him getting an early discharge. From this point on, Banks's life continued on a downward spiral, until at the age of 19, he found himself in serious trouble with the law. One night, he and some accomplices tried to break into a local bar. The bar owner was there, and Banks shot him in the chest at point-blank range. It was like a botched armed robbery. Uh, they ended up getting caught. Uh, I believe the sentence was five to seven years he had received. However, uh, while he was serving his time, uh, he actually escaped during a work detail. Uh, he was caught within five hours, and uh, they added another one to seven years to his sentence. After spending seven and a half years behind bars, Banks was finally released from prison and straight back into the community he had so despised as a youth. The 25th of September, 1982, 3 a.m., 13 years after Banks' release from prison. Police had been called to Schoolhouse Lane in Wilkes-Barre to investigate the shooting of two men. But on their arrival, they uncovered another bloody scene that was even harder to comprehend. The killing spree had actually started in a nearby property, the home of George Banks. The policemen that were at the scene, who the first responders, had identified the culprit as being George Banks. When I walked in, there were multiple bodies in the house. And you start looking around and see that you know, this was far more than just a normal homicide. It appeared to be a targeted uh, murder at that time. Banks had woken hours earlier, having partially slept off a cocktail of drink and drugs. His killing spree was spontaneous. Uh, he actually may have snapped, and he may have suffered from some profound psychological disorder. It was at that moment uh, he decided to act. He picked up his AR-15 assault rifle, and he put a 30-round clip in the gun. His first victim was fellow resident Regina Clemens. Banks then made his way through the house, shooting as he went. There were shell casings, uh, bodies everywhere. It was just a horrific scene. Within just a few moments, all of the occupants downstairs were dead. Banks then turned his attention to the second floor. He ruthlessly killed everyone in his path, even targeting defenseless children. I can remember being absolutely shocked walking in there. I, I had been in the DA's office since 1972. Uh, I had seen literally, I thought, everything that there was to see. When there becomes children involved, it really becomes much more of an emotional piece of the, of, of the whole picture. And as you think about that and seeing young kids it does have an impact of sadness and anger at the same time. I didn't think that there was anything that I could have seen that would have affected me more than that uh, until I walked into the scene at Schoolhouse Lane. In total, five children and three women lay dead. Dorothy Lyons, along with sisters Regina Clemens and Susan Uhas, had been current girlfriends of Banks, living together as part of his harem. Four of their children had been fathered by him. These were typically women who he had found on the street, who might have been homeless, who came from uh, bad home lives, and George offered them hope. You know, that, that's how it started out anyway. The vulnerable women were all at least 10 years younger than Banks. They tragically felt that a shared life with him would offer a more secure future. While his harem was developing and flourishing, it worked very well for Banks. He was able to control the women, he was able to control the children, and he was indeed the man of the house of the kingdom. For almost 10 years, 
Life at Schoolhouse Lane had worked well for Banks, but in early September 1982, after losing his job, the pressure of supporting such a growing family began to take its toll. The 25th of September 1982, 3.30 a.m., Heather Highland Trailer Park. Having fled the first horrific scene, Banks, high on drink and drugs, had made a 10-minute drive to the home of his ex-girlfriend and mother to another of his children, Sharon Mazzillo. So when George pulls up, uh, he goes up to the door. Sharon knows it's him outside. Uh, you know, it's really early in the morning, so she goes to open the door and find out, you know, what the heck are you doing here? Earlier in the year, Sharon had won a custody battle for their five-year-old son, enraging Banks. As she opens the door, she notices George is holding the assault rifle. And at that point, he shot her at point-blank range in the chest. She died almost instantly. Pushing his way past the now fatally wounded Sharon, he continued on inside the trailer. George Banks got in there. He shot his son. He shot his girlfriend. He shot his girlfriend's mother, who he absolutely hated. He shot one child who was not his child but who we later learned had made fun of his child for being half African-American. With his savage spree escalating to new heights, Banks exited the horrific scene. You know, at this point, as far as George is concerned, he's killed everybody in the home. Uh, he even says something to that effect uh, out loud as he's leaving the house. Uh, you know, I've taken care of everyone here or something along those lines. But unbeknownst to George, uh, there were still two more people in the house. The two boys, 13-year-old Keith Mazzillo and 11-year-old Angelo Mazzillo, had been hiding out in a cupboard and under a bed. Both were able to sort of peek and see what happened. So they actually saw some of the killings. As police descended on the scene, the two boys confirmed they had just witnessed Banks kill their family in cold blood. They went inside, they, they saw all these bodies laying around, all this blood everywhere. Seeing a, a, a child dead on the floor, uh, it, it's, it's overwhelming. I've seen you know, hundreds of dead bodies over the period of time, I've gone to autopsies, but that whole thing, really, the massiveness of it is, is just something that makes it stand out above the rest. Most spree killers are selective and methodical. Uh, they target particular individuals whom they believe are conspiring against them to make their lives miserable. And they want to get even with them. They, they, they want sweet revenge. A spree killer remains in a state of frenzy probably because of his mental illness uh, that makes him hyper and, and agitated uh, and depressed all at the same time. Having shot a further four dead, Banks left the trailer park physically and mentally exhausted. Banks took himself to a nearby park and fell asleep. Partially, some of this will be because of the cocktail of alcohol and pills that he'd taken, but also part of it will be an adrenaline come down. Obviously, in, in killing his partners and children, it would have been a highly stressful situation. He would have been full of adrenaline, serotonin, free histamine. When that subsided, you will feel drained and fatigued, and you will need it to have, to have literally collapsed and rested. Just over an hour into his killing spree, and Banks had so far brutally wiped out the lives of 13 people and committed what is known as a family annihilation. A family annihilator is an individual, usually a male, who believes that death is better than life for his family. If a relationship breakdown is imminent, access to the children are a problem, we tend to find in family annihilators that they will murder the mother and children, 
sometimes family pets, and then sometimes obliterate the family home. Or in some cases, it's broadened out to extended family members in other residences nearby. At around 5.30 a.m., Banks eventually woke in the east of the city, still armed and dazed from the night before, the killer headed back into town. Daylight's breaking over the city. You have all these law enforcement officers uh, searching for George everywhere. We had no idea where the suspect was at that point in time and if there was anybody else on his target list to go after. So that really put a lot of panic in a lot of people. You know, who's next, what's next, we gotta find this guy. This time, Banks traveled straight to his mother's house. The 25th of September, 1982, 5.30 a.m., Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, just three hours after 40-year-old George Emil Banks embarked on what became known as one of America's worst ever spree killings. The body count stood at 13 dead, including five of his own children, and the Wilkes-Barre police were nowhere near to catching him as they struggled to find a motive for the attacks. Thirteen years before his spree, in March 1969, after spending seven and a half years behind bars for his part in a botched armed robbery, 27-year-old George Banks had been released back into the community to start a new life on the straight and narrow. Slowly, after several years' hard work, Banks began to get his life back on track, with a growing family, including several girlfriends, and a property of his own in Schoolhouse Lane. Despite his previous felony, Banks had managed to get a job as a watchtower guard at the State Correctional Institution in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. For him to you know, be convicted and then become a prison guard um, and have tower duty, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty good. As a prison guard, his duties were in the tower. He was the guy who, who held the gun, who watched over the yard, he watched for escapees. You know, and he, he really thrived in that job. It was a job he enjoyed doing, and it was a job he was good at. Regardless of his seemingly stable existence, in the summer of 1982, at the age of 40, Banks's life began to unravel. George started acting very strange. He went and got himself ordained. Uh, he started keeping a, a journal about his life. Apparently, while he was up in the tower uh, down at Camp Hill, he was um, uh, talking about uh, you know wanting to shoot everybody uh, down in the yard. So obviously, things were really beginning to unravel during that period of time. This didn't go unnoticed by the prison. Uh, he started making comments like, you know, sometimes I think about shooting myself in the head while I'm up in my prison tower. So they put George on sick leave to seek psychiatric help. The truth behind Banks's fragile state of mind was actually far worse than authorities had suspected. So at the same time George is dealing with these things at work, He's also preparing in the back of his mind. He's thinking there's going to be a race war, that this is something he has to prepare for. What he experienced as a child growing up and the racial prejudice that he experienced is something that uh, became part of him and um, something that he could not shed. And as a result of that, as life went on, um, his views became very distorted. So he begins hoarding ammunition. Uh, he starts reading Soldier of Fortune magazines and you know, doing different things like that to prep himself for this war that uh, for some reason he thinks is uh, going to come. The 25th of September, 1982, 5.30 a.m. Metcalf Street, just three hours after the killing spree had begun. Having woken in a field in the east of the city, a heavily armed but dazed George Emil Banks arrived at his mother's house. So when George gets to his mother's house, uh, he goes inside. She, she can tell there, there's something not right, and he just begins blabbering uh, about everything. He says, I killed my family, uh, I killed everyone. And, you know, his mom's listening to him, but at the same time, she knows uh, all these weird uh, things, how George acts. Uh, it, it's nothing that's escaped her, so she decides to 
call Schoolhouse Lane to try to speak to one of his girlfriends. Telephone rang, and I answered the phone. And it was George Banks's mother on the phone. And she started talking and saying that George had told her that something terrible had happened at Schoolhouse Lane. George grabs the phone away from her. The officer tries to tell George, well, you know, the kids are alive. Uh, you didn't kill them. They're still alive. I came to the quick thought of just saying, well, yes, we're trying to take care of the children. We're trying to get them to the hospital. And he said, I know I killed them. George said he didn't believe it. It was a lie, and he slammed down the phone. We didn't know if he would kill his mother or kill himself or what would happen. Nobody or anybody else was in his target zone. The police frantically established his mother's address and raced three miles across town to her house on Metcalf Street. Let's go, let's get there, and let's apprehend him. But whilst en route, Detective Zardecki learned that Banks was again on the move. We immediately regrouped to go to House on Monroe Street, which we were understanding to be the place where George was held up. With the police now closing in, Banks had fled his mother's house, managing to escape only a few miles away to the vacated property of a friend. So once he's at uh, Monroe Street, uh, George knows that the police are going to come for him sooner or later. He gets prepared, he, he barricades all the doors, and, and in an unusual move, he, he places all these mirrors uh, around the house. He, he puts them where, you know, some people say, oh, he wanted to see if, you know, law enforcement was sneaking up on him. Other people suspect he did it, so his image would be cast there to draw away snipers. Uh, he, he was prepared, as he would say, to die. He was going to die there. He had his gun, he had extra ammo, he had this uh, fortified home uh, he had put together, and he was ready to die inside of it. We had no idea what to expect on Monroe Street. We. Uh, didn't know if he'd be locked in a house, if he was gone in to kill himself, if he had hostages. Uh, there was just no idea what to expect. Detective Zardecki remembers arriving at the scene and being faced with an unpredictable situation as a standoff commenced. Tension was huge at that time. Didn't know would he come out firing, would he shoot himself. All of a sudden, we heard the smashing of the glass. And I looked up there at that window, and the butt of the rifle was coming through the window. And we heard this ranting and raving and screaming, and George started screaming at us, he's going to kill everybody. We dove underneath the car and just tried to talk back, to calm down, to talk to him. We want to talk to you, George. We want you to come down. He would go on about his kids, and he didn't want his kids to grow up in this white, racist world. And much of his conversations and ranting were in that, in that mindset of about the racist world, the white racist world, didn't want his kids to grow up. We kept trying to convince him his kids were alive at that point in time. Banks question to the police, are the children still alive? Indicates to me that he had very mixed feelings about having taken their lives. Finally, Detective Zardecki and his team had an idea for the motive behind the spree. By killing his children, Banks thought he could spare them the torment of the inevitable race war, a perceived battle that he had supposedly endured throughout his own life. His attitude about race overwhelmed his thought process. Um, he perceived that his children may be generals in the racial war. Um, he had. Um, planned escape routes from Wilkes-Barre where he was going to store food. That um, at night he would uh, go out in Wilkes-Barre uh, dressed in black with a rifle and pretend um, he was part of this racial war. George was preparing for the standoff because as he would later say, he wanted to die. You know, he, he had killed all his children, he had killed his family, he had, you know, as he would say, saved some of them from this race war, and now he himself was preparing for death. Uh, he had it in his head that these law enforcement officers, that they were out to get him. At 7.20 a.m., with Banks cornered, police attempted to contain the situation. 
They knew George was armed. They knew he had a lot of ammunition. And they had to deal with the situation and try to do so without anyone getting hurt. George Banks that night was wearing a T-shirt that said, uh, kill them all and let God sort it out. Well, we came all the way over to this area. And at that point in time, we moved up into here. And I remember I had Detective Mitchell and Detective Tesoy were on the corner of this porch. And I was laying on the ground at that point in time. As police began positioning themselves around the siege building, more and more bystanders descended on the chaotic scene. We started having people all back in this area. Cars were coming through, all on the other side, back in that area. We had people coming through, new trucks were coming down here. There were people and news media all over the creation. At, at times, it was really almost a circus atmosphere. You have uh, approximately 150 law enforcement officers were on the scene. You had state police, you had local police. Uh, you had law enforcement officers from all over the county responding to the scene. One hour in, and an end to the siege seemed no closer. Banks remained in a position of control over the officers below. We had people literally who were in harm's way, that had no body armor, that had merely rifles or handguns, that could have been picked off very easily. He was a trained sniper. Uh, he could easily take people out. And he would later say, you know, he had more than one officer within his sights. By 8.15 AM, Zardecki and his team knew they had to somehow open up a line of communication if they were going to end the standoff. We were here for several hours during the whole siege, and we went through a series of events. So they tried to speak with him over the bullhorn. Uh, you know, he wasn't responsive. Uh, sometimes he would yell different things out the window at him, but he didn't really respond as far as, yes, uh, I'm going to come out. At one point in time, uh, I went to a side phone, to a side house over here, and made a phone call to try and talk see if I get George on the phone to try and talk with him at that point in time. But we weren't able to do anything with that. At 9 a.m., Banks' mother was brought to Monroe Street. Then we had his mother from back into the crowd up over into this area to be able to get in the way that she could talk to George. Not even his own mother talking over the bullhorn could get him to come out of the house. Almost two hours into the siege, and the police were beginning to run out of ideas for how to get Banks out alive. Many spree killers take their own lives. First they get even, and then they commit suicide. But George Banks' standoff with law enforcement may have been intended to give him what he couldn't do himself. Uh, he wouldn't drop his weapon. He'd go out in a blaze of glory. He let the police do what he couldn't do, and that is to take his life. He kept threatening to kill himself because of killing his kids, and we kept trying to convince him that they were alive and to keep him talking. In a desperate attempt to end the situation, it was decided to once again play up to Banks' apparent concern and confusion over the well-being of the children he'd just shot. Pat Ward, a young presenter for local radio WILK, remembers receiving a call during his daily broadcast. Then the telephone rang, and our reporter in the field, Bob Lighting, asked me to do something on behalf of the Luzerne County District Attorney, Robert Gillespie. He asked me if we would modify our broadcast to indicate that George Banks, in fact, had killed no one. We came up with the idea of trying to say, well, let's do a radio broadcast. Let's see if we can get somebody to do it. And uh, Bob Gillespie, who was district attorney, arranged to have the broadcast done and to actually do an interview. My first reaction was, is he crazy? My second reaction is, we've got to do this. There are lives at stake here. While Bob was setting up in the interview, I had a big boon box at that point in time, and I would be within distance that George could hear the interview. 
and hear this live interview that his children were in area hospitals, that they were being taken care of, they were, didn't know the condition of them, uh, but they were alive and in hospitals. At 9.58 a.m., the fake news interview was broadcast live across the county. The children are alive, they are hospitalized. And George Banks was listening. The 25th of September, 1982, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Having shot 13 people dead in a ruthless spree, ex-prison guard George Emile Banks had barricaded himself into the upstairs of a two-story house on Monroe Street. Below, a circus-like crowd of press and public watched on as police tried everything in their power to draw him out safely. At 9.58 a.m., in a last-ditch attempt, a fake radio news broadcast was played out over a speaker, stating that the children Banks had just shot were in fact alive and needed his help. The children are alive. They are hospitalized. But to their dismay, Banks remained defiant. Although he listened, we didn't know what was really going through his head. We could only hope to surmise or try to hope that he had some belief in what was happening. He kept saying, I know I killed them. But at the same time, uh, I think a part of him wanted to believe that, that the children were alive. The radio broadcast appeared to have failed, and police knew they needed to end the standoff before more innocent lives were lost. Remember, George yelled out, it's a good day to die. I heard policemen yell, we have them in our sights. And I'm thinking, are they going to kill him? But the police were not about to oblige this killer with a quick exit. My instructions were, do not kill this person. Let justice, let the justice system do its job. The police feared that they had run out of options to end the standoff peacefully, until, to their surprise, a former prison work colleague of Banks pushed forward from the crowd. His name was Robert Brunson, and he knew George well from the prison. And he volunteered to talk with George. And uh, he said, George, you know, he said, uh, you need to come out. I, I won't let them hurt you. I'll put myself as a shield between you and the law enforcement officers. But you need to come out. For whatever reason, uh, none of the other tactics worked, but this one did. George agreed to give up, and he was going to come down the steps and out of the back of the house and meet Brunson at that point in time and hand his gun to the people outside of the house. At 11.17 a.m., four hours after the standoff had begun, George Emile Banks finally gave himself up. At the time he was coming out, he didn't have any expression. There was no sign of any expression to anything. He just looked straight forward, said nothing, and just got him cuffed, got him to the car, and got him out of here. Almost 10 hours after beginning his merciless killing spree, George Banks was in custody. As we went upstairs to the detective room, we sat George on a chair, and I remember handcuffing him to the chair. And I walked out in the hallway, and I started to quiver. The adrenaline had gone. I became extremely emotional, and I just thought, wow. The 6th of June, 1983, Luzerne County Courthouse, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Banks stood trial for the murder of 13 people. The youngest was just under two years old. I can tell you the first time I met him was at the county prison, and um, he was in the library. He was not shackled, and there was no guards, and it was just me and him. He could have came across that table on a moment's notice and killed me if he wanted to. He didn't do that. He was very respectful. He was thankful. I can tell you from the first day I saw him to the last day I saw him, he was always alert, 
calm, very considerate. He sat, he looked, he listened, and when he wanted, he spoke. At some points, uh, as George is talking about the crimes, at some points he would cry, uh, at other points he would become um, solemn. It, it was just this mixture uh, of emotions that he would display. Um, he believed that his children uh, were going to die from some type of a racial onslaught, and he killed them uh, to protect them from that onslaught. The turning point in the trial came when Banks took to the stand. Against all advice, he revealed shocking images to the jury from each of the crime scenes. Before the trial began, I told the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that I would not allow them to admit any of the pictures because I felt uh, that they were so inflammatory that they might be held against Mr. Banks. Um, those photographs were overwhelming. Um, anybody looking at those photographs, I mean, you would want to kill the person immediately who did that. The jurors, I think, were just aghast. Um, some of them, you could see, they were starting to cry. When George put those pictures in evidence, that pretty much sealed his own fate. On Banks' 41st birthday, and only 16 days after the trial had begun, the jury unanimously agreed to a verdict. He was given the death penalty on 12 first-degree murder convictions. He was found guilty and he was sentenced for third-degree murder. He was found guilty and he was sentenced for, I think it might have been attempted murder, aggravated assault, theft, and robbery. I remember I was sitting there in the courtroom uh, crying and uh, he got off the stand and, you know, he just walked over to me and just put his hand on my shoulder and then just sat down. As Wilkes-Barre struggled to recover from the devastating spree, one question remained. What could have driven a man to commit such chilling crimes? When an individual such as Banks, who is paranoid, and that chronic behavior of alcohol and, and drug misuse can bring out the darker side of an individual, in his case, it made him quite unpredictable and prone to rages, and I think it unleashed the acknowledgement within him that his family were now a burden, and he couldn't find another way out. The thing that stands out to me more than anything is how fragile the human brain is in the, the different homicides of the many I've seen over the years. What, what sets off people? I just couldn't imagine how anyone could do that. And, and going in and looking at my children sleeping peacefully, and, and to this day, it bothers me. I do not believe that Wilkes-Barre will ever forget that day. More importantly, I don't believe that Wilkes-Barre should ever forget what happened that day. I'm not the same as I was. Uh, 30 years ago, that's for sure. But it changed my life, there's not a doubt. It definitely changed my life. What I wanted to accomplish in the sentence I think I've accomplished, George Banks is going to die in jail of natural causes, or he's going to die in the being executed, and he'll never, never walk the street again as a free man.